Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is the Business Transformation to Champion Social Change panel. We'll give uh, folks another minute or two to, to join before we start with some brief introductory remarks, and then I turn it over to our distinguished panel of experts. And it looks like people are slowly uh, trickling into the, to the session, so that's great. Hi, everyone. I know uh, people are coming into the session. Uh, we're just waiting for a few more to join, and then we'll, we'll start the discussion. Thank you. We'll go ahead and get started. Again, uh, welcome everyone to the Business Transformation to Champion Social Change panel. This is a, a panel whose topic is probably more relevant than ever before as businesses uh, work to transform their, their business model, their engagement with the public, how they buy, build, consume goods uh, in a very, very disrupted world. The basis for the conversation is a paper sponsored by Handshake, my firm. We're a, uh, social influence agency, and Philip Morris, uh, a global organization with uh, representat representation here on the panel. Uh, the paper has been written by one of our panelists, Dr. Karen Giatra of Cornell University, and it is titled Business Transformation for Builders, Social Champions, and Changing the World. Uh, links to the, the paper, which can be downloaded, are found in the, in the chat room. And perhaps later in the session, I will share my screen so all those in attendance can, can go right to the, the various links to, to download the paper. The paper provides a series of case studies and actionable recommendations for how executives can transform their business, even in the most challenging and disrupted of times. Let me introduce uh, the, the four panelists that are joining me today. First is Karen Giatra of Professor of Operations, Technology, and Innovation at Cornell University, based at Cornell Tech. Karin studies technology, business models, innovation, and business transformation. Prior to his work in academia, Karin was the co-founder of TerraPass, a venture that's helped thousands of individuals and businesses limit their carbon impact. Second, Aaron Sherinian. Uh, Aaron manages Global Communications and Transformation as the Vice President for Philip Morris International. Aaron's unique role places him, <clears throat> excuse me, at the intersection of communications, transformation for one of the largest corporations as, in the world as it makes its historic pivot to a smoke-free future. Third, Christine Harada. Christine is a climate and impact investor. More recently, she was president of IX Investments a permanently capitalized holding company that invests in the critical areas of human need, like climate change, affordable housing, and so on. Previously, she served as the federal chief sustainability officer for the Obama administration. And our fourth panelist is Denny Watson. Denny currently is the lead geo, leads the geopolitical risk practice at RAIN, R-A-N-E, a global risk services provider. Denny spent the first part of her career as an intelligence analyst at the CIA, where she created and led several innovative analytic programs and served as the president's daily briefer, first to Vice President Gore, and then second to Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld. I'll now briefly set the discussion about business transformation. And as I'd mentioned, the, the basis for this discussion is the, the paper that Dr. Giatra wrote. And, and what we have seen in you know, the last six months is that the pandemic has laid bare the ability of some organizations to thrive in a time of disruption and uncertainty, while others are barely able to survive and at best maintaining the status quo. 
Some companies are living up to their lofty visions of acting with purpose and creating value for society. And again, others are at best struggling to, to live up to that. This paper uh, was commissioned by Handshake and Philip Morris International to understand what makes for a successful transformation. And its purpose, again, is to provide insights, recommendations through the use of case studies to help organizations, the leaders of those organizations, steer their way through um, what are often complex transformations in a very challenging time. So with that, let me ask the, the first question to, to Karen. Um, walk us through the, the research, and in particular, what were some of the important lessons that you uncovered both in the, the research and in talking with, the, with many of the executives that you interviewed for the paper? Thanks, Robert, and thanks everyone for uh, joining us. Uh, so here is what we did. We examined a number of companies which shared a common circumstance, the following circumstance. All of these companies had uh, thriving, highly profitable businesses. Everything's looking good for these companies. They report uh, great earnings. But there was one catch. The conduct of their business, the way they run their business, their product, their service or business model was causing some harm to the public commons. What do I mean by the public commons? Perhaps this business was uh, causing harm to the environment. Perhaps it was uh, uh, damaging to public health in the middle of a pandemic. Perhaps uh, their product, service or business model encouraged uh, things that ruined the social life of a society, the civic life of a society, perhaps uh, inimical to the conduct of uh, fair elections. Uh, perhaps the business activities uh, uh, made the market uh, not fair and free. So in particular, all of these businesses were imposing some sort of externality, a cost on the rest of society, costs that they did not have to bear uh, themselves but the rest of us had to bear an in particular cost that were not accounted in the financial statements. So that's the common circumstance of all the companies uh, we studied. So we studied then, okay, you are in this situation, what happens? What comes next? And here is what we found. I can, I'll just cut to the chase and tell you the end of the story first. Irrespective of which company we studied, it ended up in one of two situations. Either it transformed or in other cases, the company just died. There is no situation that we could think of or we found where companies kind of could uh, could keep on running their business as usual when they were imposing these kind of externalities on the public commons. So the end state is always the same. Either you transform or you die. What did differ in all these cases that we studied is how people got to the end state. So yes, the end state is twofold. And I would, I would uh, argue that even within the companies that transformed, the way they transformed was very different. There's a lot of variety in how folks got, got there. And in particular, the main difference is how much pain they had to suffer through before they got there. So everybody uh, who survives transforms, but they don't uh, get to that transformed state with the same level of uh, pain or hurt that they, their stakeholders, their shareholders have to go through. So then we, of course, started looking at what makes the path less painful. Uh, if you have to transform or, or you die, and, and uh, if you've got to get to that transformed state, what makes that path uh, less painful? And here are some kind of key patterns we found in terms of what makes uh, this path less painful. Some from the companies we did, others that we recommend them to do, and some that, uh, and it's a combination of the best practices on top of what we think are, are critical skills to actually make these transformations less painful. Number one was start early. Not surprising, the earlier you start, the easier the transformation is. Even though this almost sounds obvious, but it is perhaps the single biggest change most folks could do. Because people take way too long to recognize what is going on. And, and uh, or even, I, I don't even think it's lack of information. In most of the cases, it was just not hearing what the world is telling them. Telling them actually is shouting at them. Now, it is not just that they were kind of uh, had blinders. But it is, it is, there's a reason behind why folks don't start early. And that brings to our second finding of people who do well. It is, it is about courage. Starting early is hard because remember the circumstance I described. Everything is looking great at that circumstance. If you're reporting great earnings every year, if you are, your business is doing better and better every year, then going out there and saying, oh, we're going to kind of burn this down and start something new is a hard story to sell. So it requires some courage and we will not recommend go, 
go burn it down. We'll recommend other methods. But irrespective of what you do, it requires a lot of courage to start when things look good. This is not starting or changing when things look bad. This is when things look good. So that's the right time to start. And that requires courage. Now, how do you really kind of sell this to, to your board? How do you really, um, courage is one thing, but it is courage is best backed by data. And for that, I think what, what we uh, uh, strongly recommend, perhaps one of my two favorite recommendations here is, is to do an externalities audit. In the same way as you do a quarterly or an annual financial audit, companies have started doing environmental audits to some extent, but, but I, I'm proposing a, a larger full-fledged externalities audit which looks at all different aspects of externalities that you might become doing or imposing on society. And I think the word audit is very important there. Audit means somewhat voluntarily submitting to an adversarial third party, which will tell you things you might not want to hear. And that's what folks need to do, not kind of hear only their own uh, own propaganda in some sense. And it is shocking how very innovative, successful uh, organizations very soon become echo, chamber, echo chambers. They don't really hear, hear things, and which is why you need external audits. Audits of externalities conducted by an adversarial third party. Um, and it's better you do it rather than actually have a truly adversarial third party, which comes and does it for you when things get really bad. And then my fourth recommendation, and perhaps my other favorite recommendation, is simply experiment. Change doesn't mean burn the house and build a new house. It means starting to explore new things in your house. And this is, again, I think uh, I'm always surprised by how the most innovative companies, particularly now in the in the tech sector, uh, they're almost run like Soviet economies. They're tightly planned central economies. There is a strong leader who has a dogma, who has a philosophy, who has a vision, generally a mythically strong leader, co-founder, founder. And, and uh, it's really dogma. There's dogma, there's commandments, there's heresies in, in all, most of the tech companies, largely because of the strong uh, leader that we know how, how centrally planned economies end. And, and I think a lot of these uh, companies need to transform from know it all to learn it all, which means you have to let folks break the commandments, start a lot of internal in- insurgencies. The word I favor the most is, uh, is experiment. You've got to have a lot of experiments running bef- to see what you how you could transform. Because you won't know the right answer. You've got to do a lot of experiments to get there. And I think um, the final recommendation is uh, it takes persistence. So despite doing all these right things, it won't kind of happen in a few days or a few quarters. It will require sticking to these principles, even when in the early days things don't, don't go well. So to summarize, I think the end state is pretty clear. You transform or die. The question, I think, in front of the uh, companies facing these kind of circumstances is how they transform. And we, we recommend firms that start early, demonstrate courage, bring in these information systems like an externalities audit and encourage experimentation, stick to it, are the ones that will make it less painful than others. Great. Thank, I mean, thank you for those really wonderful insights. And Aaron, with this very uh, stark and binary outcome in mind of transform or die, <laughs> I would love to hear your thoughts on this because you are helping lead a, a global corporation through a massive transformation that will impact its future for generations to come. And so you are, you're living the insights and the recommendations that Karen just touched on and would love to hear your perspectives on, on the transformation underway at Philip Morris. Yeah, thank you, Bob, and thank you to the professor for you're really the reason that we're together because these ideas are a chance for us to learn together. And it's an honor to be not only on this panel with, with these colleagues who I've learned from already uh, but even to be part of the Horasis global community today. I mean, this is, this is what civil society should be doing in a moment of global, unprecedented global crisis. Civil society should be coming in to accelerate uh, how we're talking about change. And the professor's paper, I think the timing, even though I don't think any of us foresaw what was coming to the world in 2020, I'm, I'm grateful that we've got something so that we're learning together. And in that spirit, I, it might surprise some people that a company like Philip Morris International would be talking about transformation, but if you know or have heard or learned about what the company's stated goals are about moving to a smoke-free future and what that means, you'll know that it's these kind of external ideas and case studies and a field guide. I think the professor even calls this paper a field guide that we all need right now because transformation just requires that kind of new thinking and not just upping one's skills, but totally changing the mindset. You know, one thing that that uh, jumps out at me at the paper, 
and reminds me of one of my first days, if I can tell a, a brief story in our New York office, you walk into the New York office of uh, Philip Morris International, a global company with, with, with people around the world. But in that particular office, you walk into a staircase where it's stated right in front of you, companies don't change companies, people change companies. And that might seem trite and might seem cute, but when you really think about it, it's some of the things that I found in this paper, which is it's got to be the people, the executives, the investors, the, the board members, the, the people who are able to say, we're going to change now, we're in a position of strength, or we're, 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 where we're in a position to make a change with those externalities, the, the product that we offer, the way that we engage with the consumer. Uh, it really strikes me that it comes down to people who are willing to, to do that. Um, I also, working as part of a transformation that is, uh, we think, unprecedented, right? Companies change, and they change for a number of reasons. And we've seen that in big change years like 1984, 85. Uh, in 2012, there was a lot of change in, the, in, in, in many industries. But uh, one of the things that has really hit home to Philip Morris International is we've undergone a massive corporate transformation uh, into products that are, uh, offering that smoke-free future uh, to the world is that you have to be very, very clear about the fact that transformation is taking place. And I know the professor will go on uh, as he discusses this, but it's remarkable how you have to just say, I think, I think professor, you call it full-throated in, in the paper somewhere, but the idea that you just have to say what you're going to be doing. And in our case, in the case of Philip Morris International, it is a clear statement that if you don't smoke, cigarettes, don't, don't start. If you don't smoke, don't start. If, uh, 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 if th that's always going to be the, the, the place to start. And that if you don't quit, change to a better alternative or that change that is part of our corporate transformation, we're saying the same thing to consumers, to regulators, to people around the world, to civil society experts and people like those in, on the call and people who've joined us at Horasis. So that idea about consistency will be called out and you need to be consistent if the transformation is real, not just when things are going right and you started it or when you were able to make a massive investment in your R&D and, and help to change the company, but also in a moment of crisis. <coughs> did your company step back the minute that something like COVID hits in its transformation or did you stay the course? So those are a few observations about A, why a company like ours would be involved in uh, or interested in, in, in the findings like this and involved in a conversation like this but we believe it is precisely the sorts of companies who have a big role to play on a big issue like uh, the issue of a smoke-free future, how to bring that to pass, big issues that are complicated. It's precisely the companies that are transforming that should be learning together from one another and then with the insights of people like, uh, uh, like Karan and, and, and like those that are on the panel today. Great. Thank you, Aaron. That, that really is a, a wonderful perspective. And Christine, I, I couldn't help but chuckling a little bit when Karin was talking about the importance of culture and a transformation. I saw all of our heads start violently nodding in agreement to that. And, and that's something that we've talked about previously. And I would love to get your thoughts. And if you could expand a bit more on the, the importance of, uh, frankly, having the, the courage to maintain the culture and the courage to stick through the tough times in a transformation. Like, how, did, how does that manifest itself in a, in a transformation? I, you're, you're, we can't, can't hear you. I'm sorry, Chris. <clears throat> Karen, would you, um, while we, while we get Christine's uh, technical uh, difficulties sorted out, would you mind stepping in? And, and I know that was, obviously you touched on it in, in the paper, you touched on it in your remarks, but we'd love to hear a bit more about kind of the connection between culture and courage and almost stick to when it comes to, uh, comes to a transformation. I think Aaron kind of put it uh, best, like uh, uh, companies and strategy documents don't change companies, people do. And people, how people behave is influenced by the culture of the company. So people will behave in a, if it is a culture where you say something and wink, wink, in all other aspects, it doesn't just apply to transformation. If that is your culture overall, that if you say one thing and then wink, wink, do something else, 
that that uh, that manifests itself in transformation. And like with all cultural and and other aspects, when people are uh, in crises, uh, uh, your character gets exposed in crises. Transformation is a is a hard thing. It's like going through a, a body change, and and that requires uh, it's stress testing your culture in some sense. So if you've uh, built a good culture where people uh, say what they want to say, transparency, honesty, I think it'll serve you very well in uh, in the transformation. So I think to kind of use an economic term, the will of a leader is complemented by the culture of a, of an organization to make it happen because you can uh, folks try this bring a new leader to change the organization but but that's not going to change everything unless unless there is uh, already the cultural uh, or the uh, so to say the reservoir of kind of uh, cultural competence to kind of uh, be honest and transform so i think culture is is critical it's a complement to to things because again it is people who change things and how people behave is is determined uh, not just by rules it's determined by culture not just by kind of official rules policies all of that in the end we are humans we are not machines so uh, we do behave uh, a lot on the non um, uh, non tangible cues which is what we call culture and and i think that is uh, that is critical uh, and you see it in companies i think like one of the things i mentioned experimentation that's a very much a cultural thing because everybody can say you want to do it but it requires the ability for top leadership to accept accept failure because experiments should fail experiments don't work always that's why they're called experiments we don't call them innovations and calling them experiments it's an important cultural difference and um, so in, in many of these aspects i think culture is key in particular in experimentation particularly kind of showing courage and and then anything to execute happens because of culture yep thank you Sorry, Christy. <laughs> uh, Danny, let me uh, let me ask you this. So there's there's a there's a number of ways to measure uh, the progress of a transformation, and, and obviously there's the you know kind of the hard numbers, the you know profit margin, the market share growth. But as we've heard already, so much of these transformations is about the frankly the soft measures, the culture, employee attitudes, things like that. how do you how do you collect the data how do you analyze the data how do you how do you actually measure the data for your transformation to see whether or not you're on the right journey and making the progress you want to make thank you bob um uh, can you hear me yep we can thank you okay <laughs> just checking uh so first i'm going to start with a bit of an adage the data you have at hand is almost never the data that you need and trying to lead a transformation forward based on existing data which is almost always uh, lagging indicators won't get you where you need to go so and second i'd say that no data at hand is going to tell you either that you need to transform how to transform or what that transformation should be so a true trans- transformation is about vision it's about imagination and to the point that christine was going to to emphasize true and that that Karen emphasized earlier really courageous leadership but in order to get there first leaders have to be paying attention to the horizon so they have to be looking beyond the data they have looking beyond the quarterly statistics they need to think creatively about what things will look like in 10 15 or 20 years because the environment in which their business is operating is not going to be the same as the environment they're operating now it's not a data question it's not an ai problem it's it's uniquely human and it takes uniquely human leadership to to get there uh and finally leaders have to be willing through this transformation to break some china and face the consequences of having winners and losers <clears throat> so how do you measure progress in a transformation so the first step is to ask the right questions while employee engagement is a fine metric for an established organization doing established practices it might not be the right indicator for a company undergoing a transformation maybe you don't have people with the right skills maybe you need to make a corporate culture change um so measuring your existing employees for engagement might not be the most the best leading indicator uh you have to measure uh a different things and an organization undergoing a transformation maybe the right metric is how well you're doing at hiring differently skilled people 
or hiring people who are representative of the diverse culture in which they are operating. Likewise, with things like customer loyalty, which is an, a very established and well-known uh, measure, in an organization that is transforming to meet new demands, new needs, new market re realities, maybe the question is not, how do I maintain my existing customers, but rather, how well am I doing in building relationships with customers and partners that are going to matter to me more in the future? So, uh, so uh, um, I wanted to go back to something that, that Karin had, had mentioned. So given how challenging it can be to make a progress in a transformative uh, organization, what's your advice for how executives can have the confidence to know that they either need to stay the course in their transformation or if they need to make some course adjustments? I think you provided some great suggestions. <laughs> These new leading metrics. So if you come up with the right metrics, for example, I think I really like uh, new customers. If you are moving, or in case of uh, case of the examples Aaron said, it really isn't perhaps new customers because they're trying to encourage not new customers, but customers who are shifting from one, one prospect to another. So maybe not a traditional metric, but a different metric that captures where you're uh, uh, going. The only thing I'll add to this is uh, increasingly we have access to non-traditional metrics. We have access to sources that uh, we have access to data streams folks didn't have before. So in a, in a um, uh, work with a particular uh, large organization, which was uh, sourcing products globally and, and the big challenge in sourcing products globally is uh, ensuring that those products, the factories which are making these products are, uh, are forming, are, are living up to your values as a, as a company. And uh, the classic mode was, well, we'll do audits, etc. And, and we all know those are, they work, but not perfectly. And, and they have had lots of, even in the best funded companies like Apple and others who are, uh, who are not kind of cost sensitive companies in many ways, or not kind of really trying to squeeze every dollar out. Even there, it's hard. So, so just in this uh, research project, all we did was we started kind of uh, getting access to employee forums. And these are uh, forums in not generally in English, in languages that people don't kind of, um, uh, not languages the markets folks are selling in, WeChat. Look at what employees are telling each other about how a company is. And, and that, to be honest, was a far, far more leading indicator. Just informal places and given kind of uh, new technology, you can sentiment analyses these forums. You can actually, uh, so that's kind of our uh, hypothesis that even without, uh, it's a research project. So, uh, but our hypothesis and early indications are that if you uh, play the data game, you might be able to get some non-traditional streams. Uh, people have also tried like Twitter streams. And, and it is basically, I think the central idea is the word on the street is often ahead of the word on the paper. So, and I think you can get that word on the street today by, by different means, means that were not possible before, blog posts and others. So that's, so I will, in, in the spirit of what you said, new metrics, uh, more different metrics, non-traditional metrics to what, because to, to um, uh, metrics which are aligned with your transformation goals. And I think the second thing I'll add is you can also get access to new, uh, uh, new data streams, which folks might have not thought about. And those data streams might be now leading indicators. And I think you have to give importance to get them because of course you have your uh, financial data streams. The sales show up every day. But it is that these streams also need to show up uh, with some frequency, with equal importance, need to show up in the CEO's dashboard or other places um, like that. So that's that's kind of all I'll add. So good metrics plus new streams. Yeah, I you know when I when I hear you know words and phrases like data and metrics and key performance indicators, I my mind immediately goes to the concept of transparency, right? I mean, this data can't just live in in isolation somewhere and. A lot of times it's people tracking data for their own use, but obviously more and more the, the public has access to all kinds of data. And, you know, Aaron, to the, to the credit of, of PMI, it's, un, it's undertaken this incredibly complex and massive transformation in a way that's been very, very transparent. Obviously PMI has to, you know, as a publicly traded company, has all kinds of disclosures it, it needs to, to file and, but, you know, you, the executive team, your your executive colleagues, you're you're out and about. I mean, you're you're participating in conversations like this, talking about the transformation, talking about what you've learned, the struggles you've you've faced. Why that commitment? 
why did you set out to really, really put a, a high burden on, on your, your transformation in yourself? Think, frankly? You know, I think it, it, a couple of thoughts on, on transparency. I'm glad we're, we're taking this on because I think those two T's go hand in hand, right? Transformation is not going to happen without the transparency because it's going to be called out and it's not going to be your success if it's not there in a couple of places. Number one, I'm not even going to talk about the consumer, even though that's absolutely at the core of everything. But it seems like something that this conversation has already talked about. Professor, it's in your paper that if it's not based in what the consumer needs and will respond to, the transformation is probably not going to happen. So that transparency with the consumer is key. Now, in a highly regulated sector, and there are many, many are discussed in this paper, it's also clear that you have to be fully transparent with the regulators because the regulators and those institutions that will help make the operating environment possible for a transformation, they have to know. That's part of their accountability to their uh, to the institutions that they serve. And so transparency is it's almost a, it's almost a given. I don't want to mean to minimize it when I say that. It's a given that has to be maintained at all times. So we're not just talking about internal information we're talking about making that same information the good the bad the must improve available on in public ways and and we have that in 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 the basics of the internet if you have an integrated report or data you absolutely positively have to have that available front and center on your website not buried somewhere where no one can find it because it's going to be found it should be found and people should be discussing what to do with it. Now, there's a, a, let me talk about a communications aspect with civil society about transparency. And Bob, you know, you may have been even uh, in the same city when, when we did this, but we've tried to be present in places where opinion leaders, thought leaders, smart people that we can learn from are, are, are present. And in one particular place, most recently, we even put out onto our sign and in, in one of these spaces, uh, recognizing that if you have a trust deficit, Transparency over time has to be something that is there. It's tr- not transparency in a moment and then things are fine. Transparency over time is a way to increase trust. But we actually put outside, uh, facing uh, the entrance for all people to see, doubters welcome. And that idea, I know it's a cultural thing, but it's about having people and inviting people to bring in the data, talking to us so that we can present science and we can openly present scientific data so that there can be a discussion around it that's civil and it's not politicized and charged. These are, these are important issues and, and, and issues, uh, sustainable development goals are issues that are, are, are passionate, right? Because it's about the future of the world. But how can we have conversations that are open and absolutely based on data and transparency from both sides? So I, I think often about that idea about doubters welcome and who, who responded to that and who brought data with them to talk about, uh, because I think that kind of transparency, uh, you can feel it from a cultural perspective, from your executives, all the way to the, the consumer. Our CEO and I, um, you know, I, I love what we've now put on, on part of the PMI's website under transformation. And the first thing he will answer when people say, why are you doing this? Uh, he will say, because it's the right thing to do. And then all of the answers that feed into the business model, the economics, the fact that uh, you know, in 2018, 92% of PMI's research and development was focused on, on these potentially better products and how that could be manifest and how you have to say that publicly and show that so that you're transparent with not just the rhetoric, not just the culture and the approach, but also, let's, let's face it, your company and your product is going to follow where your investments go. And so being transparent with that, I think, is hopefully a way to, to build that long-term trust. If I can add just a, a very briefly, um, you know, I would add, uh, in addition to courage and transparency, uh, the ch- whatever the transformation is, it has to be organic. It has to be genuine. So to, to the, the point that, that the communication is essential, it's essential internally for your workforce as well as externally for your stakeholders and your customers. But it has to be, you, you have to be convincing, compelling, and genuine about, uh, about that transformation. It can't come out of nowhere uh, um, or that the, your, neither your customers nor your stakeholders nor your employees is going to buy the change. 
So uh, that doubter is welcome. I love that. Uh, um, it, it says we are confident in what we're doing, why we're doing it. We know, and, and it comes from a genuine place. Um, I, I think it, it, in the research when Karin found uh, companies that did were not successful, it may be that it wasn't from a genuine place. They were changing for the point of changing or they were tra- changing only because of external pressures. It wasn't a genuine um, organic change. Yeah. If I may add, like transparency is also, uh, sometimes people will say, let's be transparent internally, but not externally. I think that doesn't work because, uh, uh, and this is the hard part about, uh, if I may say, lying or misrepresenting. If you do it outside, your employees see that as a way to do it inside. So that's, I think, what we find kind of most, uh, uh, that if you create a hollow image on the outside, it actually means a hollow hollow organization on the inside also. It's impossible to do it, impossible to do it in two different ways. So uh, whatever you do out to the external world, flows in internally and, and in some sense the chickens come home to roost. So uh, the, the managers who might encourage that find the same thing happening within their teams. And therefore I think um, as, as, uh, as was said earlier, really uh, transparency and consistently transparent is, is great. And of course doubters welcome I think is, uh, is a great phase in, uh, in, in given the context where you are. And I think a lot of companies end up in this situation that, um, and we can look at recent examples, some tech companies, social media companies. At this point, I think they need to go doubters welcome if they want to do anything to change because well past the time that uh, uh, that they could have gotten ahead of it. So so I think that is that is one message I would I would really echo again, that uh, if you're at the point that, that it is uh, at the point that there's some substantial doubt, then you've got to take it head on. You've got to take it head on and... Uh, and address those doubts. Yeah, let me, if I could interject, because we had a, a really good question from the audience that uh, picks up on some of the comments that have been made, which is, you know, earlier, Karin, you'd mentioned that, you know, transformations are quite binary, you know, transform or die. PMI, obviously, Aaron is going through an exceedingly transformative transformation. Is it possible to transform incrementally or are transformations truly at the kind of the organi- organizational scale that PMI is undertaking? So I think I should clarify. I didn't mean uh, the uh, transform now fully or you'll die today. I said the end point is binary. It is not necessarily that the, um, uh, so the end point is binary that in the end, eventually. So eventually, I think uh, in the long run, you transform or you die when you're in one of those situations. Now, how do you get to that? That path is not a one-day path. In fact, like I was saying, you don't want to burn the house down because that's neither sensible or, or you won't even have the money to transform that. So I think it is it is very much about uh, experimentation. So the path to transformation comes by, I think I'll, I'll use somewhat stark analogies. It is about letting internal insurgencies rise in your organization, about letting people internally challenge the dogma and do different things than what you do normally. So I think it is very, uh, uh, the path is, is uh, in fact, uh, it's not revolution. I would, I would say the end outcome is the same and is, is this binary outcome, but the path is definitely, uh, uh, I don't like using the word incremental because in that matter of courage, in matter of thinking, it is not incremental, but in, in ways of how you would put things out there, you've got to put, uh, like, like, uh, like in the case of PMI, you can't tomorrow say, let's change everything. You need to invest in, uh, R&D to make that happen. This is not the case in, so uh, uh, to determine the path and what, uh, so number one, you need to experiment in the path and try many things. What you need to experiment also depends on where the source of the externality is coming from. Sometimes it's a product characteristic, like in, in PMI. In that case, you have to do R&D to develop a better product. In some places, it's just the company's uh, uh, value system or something like that. That I think is is comes the change comes there, and then I think in most cases, like in the tech industry and other places, it might be the business model. If uh, uh, Facebook's business model is something that encourages a certain kind of uh, discourse on the on the website, and therefore uh, you need to experiment with different models. So I think the short answer is it is never uh, it is indeed not incremental but experimental. You kind of uh, it's a learning path. Uh, the endpoints are binary. And, uh, and what you need to experiment on, the pace, how, how quickly you can change things, 
depends on a little bit of what is holding you back. If it's product, it's determined by the R and D. You can't move faster than than the new products are going to be invented. If it's business model, you kind of need to make the uh, make the business model work a new business model. If it's cultural, it takes time. If it is simply kind of uh, so so. Uh, the pace depends a little bit on what what is holding you back or what's the root cause, uh, uh, but but it is uh, it should be uh, as fast as it. Can. It's a transformation, not a revolution. Okay. It's not burn out the house. It is change yep. the house. You know, I've I've observed that all of our comments have been very focused on the the transformation of the the private sector, but the the public sector at times also needs to transform. And you know, just as we are, you know dealing with a bit of a black swan event with the COVID-19. You know, Denny, you were, you were a high-ranking national security official in a probably equally traumatic black swan event at 9-11 um, and, and working with the absolute highest people in government. How, how did you see, and obviously the government had to, U.S. government in particular had to transform at that time. What did you, what did you see in that transformation? What did you see those leaders do in that era? Yeah, well, I would say that um, after post 9-11, the transformation that took place, at least in the intelligence community, was a little bit of a combination of what we've been talking about. So um, there was, after 9-11, there was a movement from inside of the organization, from the leadership all the way down to the lowest level employee that said, hey, we missed this and, and we need to change in order to get it right. It was also one of those places where there were certain uh, um, chronic issues uh, that the intelligence community had figured out how to work around, but had never really addressed. Um, so there was a piece of the the, the transformer parish um, where we were headed towards the parish point. Um, and so there was change that was imposed upon us from uh, externally. And I would say that uh, for uh, the, the ethic and the ethos of the intelligence community, those changes that were internally driven, that came from um, the, the experienced leadership, from the rank and file analyst or case officer or, or um, support officer or whoever, those changes that were internally generated um, they were effective, they were lasting, they were transformational. I would say that the um, changes that were uh, imposed on us externally, there was a new law that created a new structure. Um, those took much longer uh, to have any impact. Um, and you know, even, what is it, 20 years later, I'm not sure that those external laws have, have taken hold the way their, their crafters and drafters hoped they would. Um, because they were crafted from uh, they were uh, outside of the organization by people who didn't have the benefit of understanding the core culture, the core practices, and the unique uh, uh, issues that that surrounded why the intelligence community operated the way that it did. Um, so that that it's an interesting hybrid between transformation that was internally driven as well as externally driven. Um, and it's, uh, they're still working it out. All right. So we have just over a minute left. Aaron, you're the one here, eyeball deep in a complex transformation in a, in a very, very disrupted world. Give us, give us one lesson that all of us should take to heart from what you've learned doing leading you know, transformation. From what, I, from what I've learned today, and again, thank you, Professor. Thanks to our to our colleagues. There's more conversation, especially with Christine, that will be had, and we will facilitate all of that. But one thing that I've heard is that this experimentation has got to be about learning all across the organization, and that it can't be we've got it right. Professor, you said it earlier. This is an innovation here and it's done. It's about that journey. I, 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 I can spend so much time in the paper learning from these case studies and examples about how that journey depends on someone who can say, I, the CEO, want to learn more about how to get it done. I'm going to talk to the consumer and the regulator. I'm going to be active in civil society. And I'm going to be open about the fact that the externalities are part of what brought us here and addressing them is going to be part of how we transform in the future. So that's just my takeaway. I, I would have stayed and learned from this group all day, but I really appreciate the chance to be here. Bob, thanks for bringing us together. And, my and pleasure. This was a wonderful conversation. I really hope we can, we can reconstitute it in another venue brought to us by Zoom, right?
Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Guess we leave.